uh, discuss uh, the topic of mobility and student migration uh, in such a cross-sectoral perspective as the think tank as organization have been working on student mobility and migration for some time. Uh, and it's really great pleasure to have today uh, so many distinguished uh, speakers so that we will have a possibility uh, to discuss this issue from really cross-sectoral uh, perspective. And today in our panel discussion, uh, we have um, Professor Danny, uh, Dennis Eckert, from Paris, today from Paris, who uh, represent, uh, who is a researcher and research director at Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique in Paris and uh, in the Centre Mark Block in Berlin. Uh, today uh, we have with us uh, Natalia Shevchuk, uh, who is the Secretary General uh, of the National Youth Council of Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, Yehor Stadny, uh, who is um, uh, a vice president uh, and undergraduate student of Kiev School uh, of Economics uh, and a long-term uh, friend of CEDAS. Uh, we have Tatyana Shishkina, uh, who is in, um, <clears throat> a coordinator um, uh, of uh, mobility programs uh, in um, uh, National University of Kiev Mohyla Academy. And we have uh, Lina Zhurakovska, who is uh, a chief consultant of the Department of Sectorial uh, Economy at National Institute of Strategic Studies. So as you see, uh, all the panelists represent various spheres. Um, and I, I really hope that we will have uh, such a complex uh, discussion today. Um, before we start, I just uh, would like to remind that uh, all the uh, attendees uh, and have a possibility to ask a question either through the Q&A button, uh, which is below, uh, or uh, raise uh, the hand. Uh, we will start with small introductory speeches from uh, each of the participants, and then we will open uh, the floor uh, to questions. So if you will have uh, any questions, please uh, raise uh, your hand or just type them uh, in Q&A. Um, uh, uh, it's a very, really a pleasure to have today uh, such a discussion uh, because the topic of student mobility and student migration is a really complex phenomena and it's very often understudied I, both from empirical and theoretical perspectives and there are plenty of questions um, <clears throat> that um, uh, in line uh, uh, with in this broad uh, topic um, it's rather difficult uh, to understand uh, what drives a student migration because there are a um, plethora of factors uh, and how students decide why to move or why to stay. Um, and uh, it's an emerging process in Ukraine. So not so many uh, people, uh, students and youth are engaged in student migration. So uh, I would really appreciate it if we could have today a more horizontal discussion uh, in an informal manner, uh, just to try to think uh, how uh, this student uh, mobility and migration will develop in future and what are the challenges uh, and and try to find this uh, cross-sectoral uh, perspective. So um, I will now give a word to uh, Professor Dennis Eckert, uh, who will give us an introductory uh, speech on uh, the flows of student migrations and the special aspects uh, of uh, this issue. Please, Professor Dennis Eckert, the floor is yours. Uh, one moment, please. Okay. I hope uh, it works well and you can all uh, see uh, the shared screen. And thank you very much for this uh, invitation. I'm honored to share this uh, discussion with you today. I have five or six minutes, if I remember well. And I will simply introduce uh, the 
issue of foreign student migration in the Ukraine. Um, the, um, and make some uh, preliminary remarks. Uh, I'm just at the beginning of uh, study on this uh, issue. Uh, the issue of uh, student migration is quite popular in Ukraine, and especially because of uh, the dramatic increase of uh, out migration of young Ukrainian, especially for instance, uh, in Poland. So it's a very, very well known fact that uh, more than the half of foreign students in Poland come from, from Ukraine. Um, more interestingly, in my view, uh, the fact that uh, in the whole region, including uh, Belarus, uh, Ukraine, Poland, the number of uh, the general number of, in, of students is sharply declining. So you have uh, extreme spectacular figures uh, coming as well as from Russia, as from Ukraine, Belarus and Poland that will uh, signify and show us a decline of more than 30% of the uh, students, a number, general number of students in the whole regions. Um, but uh, the interesting fact is that uh, the uh, foreign students are, have become a sort of asset for uh, local universities. And for instance, surprisingly, uh, in Belarus, 50% of foreign students come from Turkmenistan. According, from, uh, according uh, to official statistical data, I have no uh, other source uh, as uh, the statistical yearbooks published by each uh, government. Uh, if you look at the recent uh, foreign migration of students in Russia, you have also a very particular uh, landscape because despite the fact that many students come from the whole world, there is a significant concentration of uh, origins of students in former uh, Soviet Central Asia. 40% of all students, uh, foreign students uh, present in Russia come from Central Asia. Uh, they this is also a very interesting uh, fact. On the contrary, uh, and uh, it's a sharp contrast with all other neighboring countries, the origins of foreign students in Ukraine are extremely uh, diverse. Uh, the first nationality is uh, India with uh, more than 20%. So you have a great variety of origins in the case of Ukraine. And this is the single case uh, among these four uh, countries where you have a highly globalized uh, system of origins of all these uh, foreign states. I have also made uh, some preliminary uh, research on the regional uh, um, of the places where um, uh, foreign students uh, locate themselves in the Ukraine. And uh, you see that uh, Kyiv, surprisingly, is not the first place for uh, foreign students. Kharkiv is uh, the first city. Uh, uh, these are uh, absolute number figures, and if you look at the uh, um, percentages in 20, um, uh, 2010, uh, you had a strong concentration in Kharkiv and some uh, high percentages in Odessa and Venezia. But if you can compare with the present situation, you have a significant change, a shift in this uh, geogra regional geography, Kharkiv staying as a leader, but you have uh, a sort of spreading of the 
uh, concentration percentage of foreign students and the whole uh, southwest region from uh, Ushorod uh, um, to Odessa. So you have, there are uh, within less than a decade, you can observe significant shifts in the regional repartition of foreign students in the Ukraine. And this calls for a further investigation of local strategies of universities, because in this demographic situation where the absolute numbers of students are declining and where the resources of universities are also declining, foreign students are becoming an asset for the development of local academic systems. And here you have my final um, map where you can compare the absolute number of uh, students in every region, in each region, and inside the circles you have the contribution, the share of foreign students. So my uh, short conclusion is that um, the foreign migra student migration in Ukraine has become not a regional but a global phenomenon, and second, that uh, the capital city is not the main place of this of the regional uh, this, uh, geography of uh, 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 student mobility, foreign mobility in the Ukraine, and then uh, there are significant concentration in southwest and in uh, Kharkiv. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Eckert, for such an overview. I would like to ask Natalia uh, Shevchenko uh, to comment uh, on the issue that, according to the data that we uh, very often receive uh, on the basis of different uh, population surveys, uh, a huge share of youth uh, would like to emigrate. So each fourth or each third, uh, depending on the question, would like to leave Ukraine. So just try to look at other perspective, not only on those who are coming, but on those who are saying that they would like uh, to leave Ukraine. How do you think why such a huge uh, share of people, of youth, uh, is looking um, abroad uh, on the West uh, yeah, uh, would like to move, uh, yeah. Please, could you comment on this data? Thank you, Alexandra. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, I will give a perspective from the NGO sector and uh, of my own background of interacting with young people. Uh, first of all, uh, I believe that uh, it depends in what way. Uh, the social study was conducted uh, because uh, depending on the matter how the question was formed, if uh, it was asked uh, if young people would like to move uh, to another country or they are having already plans to move. Um, as the National Youth Council of Ukraine, uh, we were conducting recommendations to the uh, Youth Strategy 2030 EU strategy of Ukraine, and we had a bit another data which was saying that uh, around 76% uh, uh, of uh, young Ukrainians have never traveled abroad. Only 21% uh, of young people have been abroad, and uh, only 3% of young people often and uh, uh, the main. Uh, point why young people would like uh, to move about. Uh, it, it is linked to the uh, community can uh, provide for the young people. At the age like 17, 23, like very common uh, thing that young people are seeking for opportunities for self-development, self-realization, and finding uh, possible ways uh, 
to socialize within the society and uh, find resources like how they can live later on. Uh, so in these terms, uh, in matter of uh, migration in Ukraine, um, if we are talking about uh, those regions uh, where are not so many international youth uh, students, where are not so many uh, working uh, NGOs which actually provide opportunities for young people, uh, we see that uh, as a National Youth Council. Uh, that youth activism is not uh, so well developed in these regions and also that uh, the knowledge of English or other foreign languages is uh, quite uh, quite on the low level so it also influences on the uh, level of migra migration because yes young people would like to visit some other countries but uh, in terms of economical situation, in terms of uh, knowledge uh, of information, how to do this uh, in simple way, how to open a visa or how to uh, receive a, a passport, uh, not, not internal one, but uh, like for, uh, for international uh, traveling. Uh, not so many young people, even at the age of 17 or 23, uh, are informed well, like how to do this uh, basic uh, things. So mostly, if you talk about migration, uh, most of opportunities are coming from Erasmus or some other uh, international programs, which uh, uh, in some way can provide uh, uh, cost coverage for traveling, food, insurance, uh, and so on. And basically these programs help uh, to become like open door for young people to visit uh, not only uh, EU countries, but also uh, some other countries like USA, if you call about some other exchange programs. Uh, if we are talking about uh, young people uh, who are involved um, in um, vocational education and trainings, I mean, uh, if you talk about, uh, but, uh, professional technical uh, colleges which uh, uh, perform as a place for uh, providing education for young people which will be involved in uh, some uh, services uh, engineering stuff and so on uh, the uh, the level of migration depends actually on the level of knowledge of english because if young people don't know the working language, it's uh, even if they are good specialists, it's very difficult for them to uh, move to some other uh, countries. So uh, in general, to sum up, my answer will be that uh, there are some uh, other uh, factors, uh, knowledge of languages, knowledge or access to information, uh, economical situation, which can influence uh, on the general situation when young people declare that they would like to move and when they actually come to action and uh, they use these opportunities and uh, uh, say yes to migration and uh, to better education and to opportunities which can be provided in uh, other countries. Thank you. I uh, hope that answers. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, now I would like to pass the word to uh, Tatiana Shishkina. Uh, Tatiana, could you please give us a general overview of the tendencies concerning student mobility, if you can, and probably if you could uh, just link um, in your answer to um, the issue that was uh, raised by uh, Professor Dennis Eckert, how these flows are shaped. Um, but probably by some programs, uh, do students uh, choose uh, certain places? Uh, is this, um, uh, is the, are these flows concentrated in some regions or are they diverse? Uh, who participate in the programs? Uh, please. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, uh, it is very nice to uh, be present here. Uh, so first of all, I have to um, indicate that I'm student mobility coordinator. So I'm a coordinator exchange programs. Uh, so that is a part of university program of Kiev Mahila Academy. So it is not about 
um, ability to study full-time programs. So uh, these programs are, um, mm, so to better understand, so they are included, so they are in integral part of study plan of students of Kiev Mahila Academy. So it is my, um, so it is, uh, my responsibility is my, my duty is at my working place. So to uh, uh, maybe uh, I want to uh, say a few words and to totally agree with uh, uh, Natalia uh, about uh, words are really not the same that uh, actions. So like if you are asking about, uh, so, uh, uh, before our uh, discussion today, I had discussion with the students who are now the mobility, and it was nice to hear from one student. So uh, after I asked the question, why? Uh, so why not all students are applying for exchange programs? So and uh, the main answer from from like my students was. Mm, so if you are will ask a student at KMC, it is like our uh, place in Kiyoma Hill Academy. So um, do you want to go for exchange? So never, uh, no, nine uh, of 10 uh, students will say yes, of course. But uh, then if the follows question, what have you done for that? So uh, not a lot of students will like um, tell that they are like uh, were looking for programs. So or they are like contact have contacted to the international office. So uh, this so I would would like to support the point. So words are not equal to the actions. Um, uh, and I uh, so to talk more about um, about the um, um, uh, to, to talk more about how this uh, what so uh, what which students or what kind of students are going abroad so uh, what are their main motivation so so uh, to be clear I'm not just like I haven't done any statistics, so but it was like just from my knowledge where, uh, during my um, yeah, doing my duties. Yes, yeah, so um, the main uh, idea, and it is very, it was very nice to hear from a student that I was uh, asked about that. They have an idea that they are took some. Um, some knowledge, some skills, and they gonna bring them home. So it is. It was very nice to hear that uh, students. So none of the students that I asked the question. So um, they haven't answered. So I gonna stay here where I'm at the mobility. Yes, but we have to understand that uh, I had taught with a very tiny group. So they are not represent all students who want to go abroad to study. Uh, and um, another thing that we have to understand why not all students are applying for the mobility. So as my, uh, my colleague or um, my colleague here at the discussion, uh, Natalia told that uh, Erasmus is the hugest, is the most, the biggest, uh, I don't know, like, a partner with the mobilities so and at other also um, like um, partners so they have some uh, limitations for so for example um, uh, so they there are not that much uh, scholarships to give the students so uh, to be sure so all scholarship that we have all are used so it is not a question of uh, so, so if students are not going, it is not about that we have scholarships, but they are not going because of their will. Yeah. So all scholarships are used. Um, another question is that uh, according to these exchanges, so um, they are present some fields of studies. So when like um, so some of the agreements are fixed to the like some particular fields of studies. 
And uh, so, for example, if the university can uh, teach students uh, about law, but we have no agreement for the law department, so our students cannot go for law department uh, and like some kind of that. So it is another part of limitation. Uh, and. Uh, uh, language, it is also the issue. So uh, most of our students are using English as an academic tool. However, uh, some of the universities are preferred to teach students in a local language. So for example, in Spain, or um, it is sometimes an, uh, a point in Germany as well. Um, maybe, um, uh, what else? Uh, uh, maybe uh, the um, thoughts, some se several thoughts about uh, what uh, our students think about uh, their future uh, after the mobility. I think it is uh, the um, question of this discussion. So I think it is important to say this. So um, uh, some of the students uh, told me that they uh, really want to continue their studies as a full-time student. So they, uh, after the mobility, they uh, see that they have this opportunity. They have like the, this um, menu, you know, so uh, of all, um, uh, all opportunities for them. So from Ukraine, maybe it is not that clear how it works, but after the mobility, they know how, how it works. Um, so it is not that, uh, so again, I would like to stress that students are not really want to go from Ukraine, like, uh, to live, yes, to live somewhere. They want to get some knowledge and bring this something very uh, important to Ukraine and to uh, grow something from that knowledge uh, here. So it is, uh, I think it is the main point that I would like uh, support here today. And uh, one more thing, uh, students after the mobility understand that actually they are not, uh, so when students are just going for the mobility, they think that they are not that much smart than European one students. And after this mobility, they uh, develop their opinion that they are really cool, they have a good knowledge and uh, they, but uh, the implementation of their knowledge, they have the, the better field in Ukraine. So yes, I think it is it. I, th I wish I have answered the questions. Thank you, Tatiana. Now I will pass the word to Yehor Stadney. Yehor, you are free to comment the previous speakers. And um, yeah, I would like uh, to um, stress that uh, the motivation of students is really different. And uh, Tatiana was talking about mobility programs from a rather high level university in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, the cohort of students uh, students is really diverse and there are different motivations uh, and sometimes uh, students may choose not to leave Ukraine or to leave Ukraine and um, and not to return. Um, yeah, uh, I would like you or you to uh, probably to comment on uh, um, all the previous speeches, and if you can uh, say a few words about possibilities uh, to have a good education, not leave in Ukraine, that input would be all also very valuable. Thank you, Sandra. And uh, well, I don't have any slides, and uh, but I think that um, the very interesting thing here to study the student uh, migration is how, uh, well, in a nutshell, each buyer could find uh, a proper offer. So uh, depending on the motivation and depending on the reasons why students choose to go abroad to study, whether it will be uh, out of Ukraine or inflow to Ukraine, 
this is a combination of the uh, uh, how much it is easy to apply, how much it is easy to enroll, meaning like the phase starting from the after you pass some documents to border guard, security office, immigration office, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, visa application. And this enrollment phase starts after you, uh, well, compete or not compete with other uh, entrants uh, for your enrollment to the university. So is it easy or not to enroll to the university? So is it easy to study at the university? Uh, is it easy to study, meaning uh, that, well, what is the attrition rate? What is the dropout rate for foreign students? Are they uh, uh, more valued than domestic students for universities, for example, in many meanings? Uh, then is it easy to stay after the graduation? And what is the policy of the country concerning those human capital, concerning those students? So taking, like grabbing all those factors, like combining them, we'll have like different approaches and policies uh, in different countries, which attracts or not attract, uh, or, don't, or, the, or, or don't attract any students with uh, particular motivation. So if we take Ukraine, we definitely attract for our cheap level of study, relatively cheaper than in uh, other countries, especially if Indian students, for example, comparing us to British universities, for example. Or, well, I think that any other Western comparing to us universities, or even Russian universities, then uh, is, it, is, it, is it cheap to live uh, in a particular city or country? Uh, well, again, uh, I think that we attract in a way that it is cheap to live here, it is cheap to study, and it is, well, uh, if we don't take into account the corruption in the process of admission and enrollment, starting from the, the you need to pay bribes to security office to just get a visa, for example, or to, to, to have approved your invitation to go here. Uh, but it is, uh, and those are all obstacles, definitely, that students need to pay bribes to enter here. But the desire of those students to enter Ukrainian universities higher than this obstacle uh, uh, that they pay bribes. And the key question is like, why? <laughs> why it is? So uh, in a normal situation, if you are asked to pay a bribe, well, the normal reaction would be like, okay, I will avoid this path. I will avoid this track. I will look for something else. But those students are really interested in that. Not in all, not in all cases, yes, the, 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 you need to pay a bribe, but this is a, a horrible problem here in Ukraine with that. And again, uh, is there any policy for students after the graduation? Uh, do we have any tools to integrate them during the study and after they finish them? And uh, is it a policy to recruit human capital for labor market, et cetera, et cetera, or to attract some specialists like, it is interesting how we actually trying to attract. Um, you, you, you see, uh, that could be enough topic for our discussion, but Ukraine uh, now at least publicly struggling to summon IT specialists from Belarus. And it is very interesting having, well, relatively good study programs in IT and uh, some of them are very good designed and modern. Uh, uh, we are not struggling to attract foreign students to those programs in order to uh, prepare a future IT specialist. But we are trying to attract uh, uh, IT specialists from like uh, uh, totalitarian regimes like Belarus, for example. And uh, here is the question really, is it, uh, is it, uh, 
uh, element of systematic policy of attraction certain specialists to Ukrainian labor market, or this is an episode, such an like uh, well, just one attempt uh, to say that we are caring uh, about the issues in Belarus. So uh, for me, from my perspective, this is like that we don't have any strategy in Ukraine. That again, uh, and without any strategy, it seems like we simply uh, want to earn some money as universities, uh, as uh, those firms who recruit foreign students for those universities, because the most, the weakest side of this process if we're talking about universities, that they do not do themselves the recruitment. They do not do the selection themselves. They do not do the offer themselves. Basically, they are just waiting till the recruit company will bring them some students. And this is the, an another thing that the attitude of those universities, because it's, it's really important for normal university to shape the student body according to their values, according to their goals. But here we have rather like passive position. Uh, so, and I think that, well, um, this is pretty much the same, maybe a part of the corruption side. This is pretty much the same story about Ukrainian students in Poland, because it is relatively easy to apply, relatively easy to enroll, it's easy to stay on track, to not get dropped out. And uh, well, uh, it's not so easy, but again, easier than in Ukraine to stay in Poland after graduation. You just need to agree to a job which not necessarily connected to your education degree, which could be even lower in terms of competences and qualifications lower than your higher education degree state. And uh, what is actually different uh, in that side compared to like Poland and Germany in terms of Ukrainian students, that this track in Germany or uh, countries from Anglo-Saxon world, that it is not so e easy to enroll so there is a selection procedure. You need to show the level of knowledge. You need to prove that you are capable to start study. And uh, uh, again, I think that uh, this is uh, deep down in the policy level, on the policy level, whom to attract? Because we know that Germany immigration policy is I must say, like more sophisticated than in other countries, for example. The same thing with Canada, for example, because they have a targeted policy to attract brains across the world. So that means that it will be easy to apply like many formal procedures, but it is not so easy to enroll. And definitely it's not so easy to stay on track. But if you have succeed in that, you are most welcome specialist on Canadian labor market because they are, well, for sure, they knew that they will gain needed human capital. And in this perspective, actually, the very interesting thing is how Canada attracts and summon uh, future PhD students. They uh, uh, doing this emphasis on the third level of education. So my main point is that well, numbers, numbers don't say much actually. It's, it's really more important to see uh, what is the breakdown for different kinds of motivation and reason why students choose to go somewhere and how it is aligned with uh, uh, public policy. And this policy is uh, not one, well, uh, this is not one sector policy, actually. This is higher education, at least this is at least migration, immigration policy. So this is interiors, 
And this is a, a policy for uh, economy development in terms of labor market and uh, labor force. So uh, I think that uh, we always need to look uh, deep inside those numbers. And uh, well, yeah, it is actually hard to ask students constantly why you go abroad and uh, etc. to analyze that. But sometimes some uh, uh, proxies, we could say, we could name them proxies, like characteristics of the approaching different policy on different policy levels could uh, say that okay it's rather more about getting money than prospective human capital for labor market or vice versa thank you okay. Yohor. uh it's a good link to the next speaker who is lina jurakovska who is working actually on the issues uh of uh, policies on labor market. And I would like uh, Ms. Lina Jurakovska to talk more about these connections of the labor market policies and students' decision to choose or to stay uh, in the country. Дуже дякую. Вітання всім. Погоджуюсь з моїми колегами та поділяю їхні думки. And uh, on my part, I would like uh, just to share some data of uh, so social uh, surveys uh, to explain more why foreign students come to Ukraine, why other countries are inviting Ukrainian students, why students uh, come back and why they stay on. You know that migration policies of uh, many countries is uh, focused on the preferential treatment for foreign students. Foreign students are entitled to work during their studies, 15 to 20 hours per week. And with each year, we see the increase in the number of countries that allow country students to stay in the country after graduation for six months, for instance, in Swiss, Denmark, Norway, 12 months in Poland and the Netherlands, and eight months in Germany. Besides, if uh, they are able to find employment within this time, they do not need to prove uh, the, that uh, they are staying for legal reasons. In average, from 15 to 30 percent of foreign students uh, stay on in the country where they studied after they finish their program. For instance, uh, as of uh, 11th of May uh, 2016, European Parliament uh, passed a new directive 2006-11 uh, that is aimed at uh, making uh, the EU countries more attractive to third parties. Uh, and uh, all uh, EU members, apart from uh, Denmark, uh, Great Britain, are supposed to implement uh, this uh, directive and uh, they are supposed to allow the foreign students to work uh, no less than uh, 15 hours uh, per week and uh, stay on in the countries uh, for no, uh, no longer than nine months. The assessment of uh, this uh, policy and regulation uh, would be presented uh, in uh, 2023. In terms of the opportunity employments for the students after they graduate, uh, I think that uh, this helps them to be more motivated while they study. According to the uh, global survey of career expectations among foreign students uh, with over 1,000 respondents in 18 countries of the world that was held in 2014-2015, uh, 92 percent of respondents stated that the opportunity to have a part-time job and uh, gaining practical skills uh, during uh, their study is the important factor. About 70 percent of foreign students mentioned that their career prospects is uh, the decisive factor while selecting the university to study. In Ukraine, unfortunately, the similar approach is not used. According to Ukrainian legislation, the foreign students are not entitled to work while they study, and after graduation, they are supposed to come back to their country of origin if they have no legal grounds to continue their stay in Ukraine. Given the demographic situation, 
and the forecast for the demographics in Ukraine in the next decade, the engagement of the foreign students in the national labor market might be considered as one of the factors to secure economic stability for the country in terms of employment, since they are viewed as the resource for human capital and demographics improvement. As I mentioned, with every year, the number of foreign students in Ukrainian universities goes up. For instance, in 2019, the number went up by 50 percent versus 2011. There were about 80,000 foreign students. Uh, Professor Dennis Eckert mentioned that mostly those are students coming from India, Morocco and Azerbaijan. But with the spread of uh, coronavirus and uh, with the lockdown restrictions, uh, some changes were introduced into the learning process. And as of now, as of October 26, 2020, 26,000 um, students less arrived to Ukraine compared to, to previous two years. One more interesting survey, how do you, foreign students pick Ukraine? On December 7th, the uh, International Center of, for um, Public Education uh, stated uh, that 70% uh, of foreign students' respondents uh, said that they picked Ukrainian higher educational institutions because they are happy with the quality of uh, study. 60% of foreign students were satisfied with the tuition cost, and 35% of uh, foreign students picked uh, a Ukrainian education because of, of the recognition of uh, certificates uh, and uh, um, uh, about 20% uh, uh, said that uh, this is uh, because uh, they will, will be able to be employed in other countries. How have they learned about uh, Ukrainian universities? 30% uh, uh, from their friends, 20% uh, uh, from recruiting companies, and 5% uh, found out about Ukrainian universities on the website. Besides, uh, there was the survey on uh, the obstacles for foreign students coming to Ukraine in terms of obtaining visa. In our opinion, uh, the lack of uh, employment permit uh, during the study for the foreign students uh, decreases motivation for them to come to Ukraine, and Ukraine is losing uh, this uh, potential in uh, human resources. Citizen Center might have mentioned uh, that there was this survey conducted in Poland among Ukrainian students. And according to that survey, 50% of Ukrainian students uh, during their studies uh, have work and 2% uh, work uh, full time. I would like also to share the results of interesting uh, survey on the migration attitudes among students. According to a social survey of the International Institute of Education, there was the survey conducted uh, by uh, Lviv uh, National University, Lvivska Polytechnica, and uh, Kyiv Polytechnical Institute. According to that survey, students are rather willing to study abroad. One in four of uh, Kyiv uh, Polytechnical University and Lviv Polytechnical Institute wanted to study abroad. Although, even though they wanted to study abroad, uh, the respondents are not really certain about the opportunities to actually go and study abroad. Lviv Polytechnical Institute had only 16% of students who see the real opportunities to go and study abroad, and only 9% of uh, Kyiv Polytechnical Institute see it possible to come and study abroad. 21% of uh, Lviv uh, Polytechnical Institute and 17% uh, of uh, Kyiv uh, Polytechnical Institute uh, were um, ready to go back, and uh, 20 about 20% of the respondents said that they are ready to stay on in the country they want to study in. About 50% uh, say that uh, they have the opportunity to study abroad, 55% uh, for Lviv Polytechnical Institute, and 42% of uh, Kyiv Polytechnical Institute said that they have real opportunity to go and work abroad. What was the main deterrent for the students not going abroad? It turned out uh, that uh, the family reasons uh, were mentioned uh, 
most frequently. 78% said that family matters are holding them back in Ukraine. Besides, uh, patriotic feelings were mentioned uh, by 32% of the respondents. And one more interesting survey that was conducted, if I have time. Do I have time? Yes? So one more survey was uh, conducted at the National University Kyiv Mohila Academy. The students uh, there were asked about uh, their choice uh, of uh, going study abroad. And even though the, uh, the uh, major subjects uh, were not the decisive factor, we see that uh, those who study IT are most likely to go abroad. Probably this is because uh, this is uh, the career choice without borders. Uh, so they have uh, showed that uh, they feel that their mobility options for them are the highest and the least uh, positive uh, answers uh, were among uh, natural sciences. Uh, probably this is uh, because uh, the natural sciences are not uh, that popular in Ukraine and uh, students are very much interested in studying abroad. But for the economics uh, department, uh, they as if seem to be the most mobile and uh, most often using uh, the uh, mobility programs. Uh, but uh, they feel uh, that uh, they uh, can find employment over here uh, since uh, the undergraduate students uh, have some prospects in Ukraine and uh, they see uh, their opportunities here. And uh, political uh, studies uh, feel uh, strongly about uh, their national denomination in terms of uh, staying in the country. It also turned out that students uh, that are in their final years of study in a bachelor's degree and a master's degree have uh, far lower hopes of uh, migration and uh, do not want to migrate compared to first uh, grade students. Maybe that is because uh, these uh, uh, students uh, have the opportunity to work and compared to, to the first year students. Besides, they have some personal relations that are also holding them back in terms of migration. And students see it more realistically in terms of migration. And, you know, they see that it requires some emotional resources. So quite often, these young students of first years uh, are feeling um, very abstract about migration since this is kind of a trend, but uh, they are less uh, likely to take any actions uh, to, mi uh, to migrate from the country. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Uh, now I would like to open a floor for questions and answers. Um, yeah, if you have a question, it's better to raise a hand and uh, our tech support uh, and host of the event will give you an opportunity to voice your question. So if you have a question, you can raise this question. So yeah, we have one question from uh, uh, Navahitova. Um, yeah. Anna Vahitova, you can, you have now an option to ask a question uh, with a voice. Доброго uh, дня всім. Hello, everybody. Мене запитання до пані Ліни. Hello, everybody. I have a question to Miss Lina, so let me ask it in Ukrainian. So, the sociological surveys that you named. I understand that people who study natural sciences move out because there are no possibilities for them to develop their career here. But if IT students is a very mobile group and they can work anywhere, then probably their um, motivation to move out is a little bit different. It can be explained in a different way. So. Is there anything in this uh, studies that you named? Is there a study of this question in this uh, research? Зараз ви чуєте, пані Ганна Вахітова? 
Would I repeat? Пані Ліно, можливо, ви можете вимкнути переклад для себе, для того, щоб послухати питання. Можливо, це так спрацює. So, uh, Ліна Жураковська, you have to switch off the translation so that you would uh, hear the question that was asked in Ukrainian. And uh, Ганна Вахітова, could you shortly repeat the question, please? Uh, ви мене чуєте, пані Ліно? Так, так, чую. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry, I got everyone confused here. So my question is, so you mentioned some researchers. Do they mention anything about the motivation of IT students because they could perfectly work out of Ukraine? So maybe this is not their main motivation to move out. Thank you very much for this question. Well. I can give you the link on this research. It was the uh, research held by the student, but uh, uh, all, almost 500 students took part in this poll and they did a research. And this um, topic is not described there, but I can give you the link and you can read it. I found it. Maybe you will find some interesting information there. Any other comments? Tanya, with Pani Larissa Chovnyuk. Good morning. Uh, um, yes, my first question and comment, uh, if I may. Well, maybe Miss Lina answered um, the first question I had. Um, so I also the head of international department in the university as well as Miss Tatiana and it's very interesting. I heard some data about my university that I never heard of, and it would be very interesting. So this is the research, yes, that was a qualification work of a student. Yes, I just gave you the link in the chat, but I don't see it. Do you see it? I don't see it yet, but I think we will find it. Yeah, thanks a lot. But my comment uh, responds a lot to what uh, actually uh, Igor was saying. Um, this is about, uh, uh, actually, this is about uh, international students in Ukraine, and that uh, we are somehow very much concentrated on the process rather than on the complex of the issue. The four is, uh, or um, that uh, why we need international students with us. So do we have an exact answer on that? Is it because this is fashionable or because this is economic income or about uh, this is something else? And so it also resonates a lot to what uh, Panelina was uh, saying. Do we potentially can consider our international students as uh, uh, as employees? But this is not about actually this is not about uh, only uh, this migration issues, uh, all the permits, labor permits, residence permits, uh, extension. So I'm also involved a lot uh, on my position uh, into these issues and I know how complicated uh, all this story. But this is also about, for example, the language of instruction for international students. If, uh, if you would look even to uh, this you mentioned, so I'm referring to what uh, Panelina was saying about the recent presentation uh, of a few days ago by UDCMO, Ukrainian State Center for International Education. I think it's uh, in English sounds like that, uh, that most of the students are interested to study in, uh, in Ukraine, in English or in Russian. So very few in Ukrainian. Um, I definitely don't have anything against English, so it should English language should exist, and uh, I'm definitely in favor of uh, certain programs which could be taught in English also for in international and Ukrainian students. But okay, so if we would start thinking maybe in more complex about uh, international students as potential uh, labor force, they somehow would need probably Ukrainian language more, and this is probably one of the reasons that in certain countries like. Uh, um, in Czech Republic, in Slovak Republic, if you are studying in a local language, you are studying for free. So this is interconnected. And also, uh, uh, but as for the, uh, also it's an issue of who are our, inter so what uh, the specialization our international students are mostly interested in. If you would look at the statistics, so what international students are studying in Ukraine, 
you would see that 80% about, I could be mistaken with exact figures, they are medical students. So what does it mean in this case? So, and if you would approach, I would just invite you to approach any medical university. Maybe it's not, it would not work now when mostly I'm probably also medical students are studying online, but if you would approach, we will be back to normality, even uh, for, you, for those in uh, Kyiv, whatever other university. So approach the campus of the university, you will see and most of the faces there. And, yeah, so most of the, so many students are in so this, are we looking for income? So what is going in our sphere? So it's a, uh, I would like to add also a complexity of to this situation because we are facing now in Ukraine also the lack of medical professionals. At the same time, uh, about half of medical students in Ukraine are international students. How this all works together? So who not, will not probably stay in Ukraine? So they will not replace our uh our doctors our nurses and those international students are studying mostly in english so we are training them for their local countries mostly so the four is what is uh, is it correct the situation actually so how it's all uh, benefits uh, us as a country uh, in total and uh, as for the uh, local students, so if to transfer to, to, to the um, uh, to other situation, Ukrainian students, uh, uh, Ukrainian students going uh, abroad. So I would never believe that uh, any so this uh, any barriers, if we would just discuss uh, the situations as how to improve education in Ukraine, this is good. Definitely, if our education would be uh, of higher quality, of high quality, so it's definitely perfect. But if the students would see, uh, uh, and we are discussing here the mobility of students, of smart people who are in, it's like special uh, type of migration. Pani Larissa, problem with связком was pogna chute. На який момент ви перестали мене чути? От щойно буквально, зараз добре чути. Okay, sorry. So if, uh, uh, so I was talking about our students, Ukrainian students' migration. Uh, so this, uh, I was saying that in case, uh, even in case our education would be, would uh, be of uh, better quality, this is definitely very much needed. But if uh, young people, students, as uh, they are smart people, uh, would see that personally would they would develop anywhere at whatever other location either professionally or as researchers or something else uh, so this uh, they would but if there would be definitely possibilities and they very often know how to look for possibilities so they would move so again so it's not only about the quality of education even in ukraine it's about something better something else so if uh, they Again, so about the possibility to realize him or herself uh, locally. So this is about that. Thank you. Sorry, this was rather long comment. Thank you for the comment. Um, so uh, I see your hand and I remind all the participants of the panel that you are free to ask each other questions and to react to the words of each other. Uh, so we would uh, be um, thankful for such a horizontal cooperation. So Yehor, please, the floor is yours. Uh, I'll start in Ukrainian because that was about this uh, latest survey by the Ministry of Education. Uh, well, I know a little bit about the capacity of the Ministry to do any researches, so I would like to draw your attention to the number of interviewees. Um, what is three percent of people who say that they are attracted by the quality of uh, the um, education. There's only 42% of those 23 who were interviewed. And there were more than 450 interviewees, and they were studying mostly on English uh, speaking programs. And only 20% uh, of those said that they came here because of the quality of education. And it tells us a lot, actually. Um, 
I think the following. I do like using examples. For example, when we have lack of policy, it's always an issue. Um, when we face the problem of lack of medical specialists, especially when we have about uh, high, uh, about the medical assistance of high quality, not the first aid, it's obvious that we don't have any policy in this economical sector. Because students from India who enter Ukrainian universities and the first instance they seek um, uh, education that would cost them less because our education is 10 times uh, uh, more cheap than British University, for example, but also um, this is a very clear economical uh, um, calculation and we will never be able to attract international students who to stay here because uh, um, who graduated from uh, medical um, uh, uh, institutions because the mathematics just doesn't work here. Yes, the weird situation is about IT. Uh, this is what Miss Hanna asked. We observe a boom and a huge demand on IT specialists. We see a lot of vacancies being opened, like there were 50,000 new vacancies in 2000. Um, 18 and 60,000 of new vacancies in 2019. And, uh, but we have the least number of uh, international students at I, in IT uh, faculties. There is uh, medicine, it, international relations, economics, etc., etc. But again, we don't have state policy to attract more international students to IT departments. The segment of uh, vocational education. It could be very attractive, especially for the countries which uh, give us traditionally a lot of international students because they really have um, troubles with vocational education. The level of uh, this vocational education is not as the level at Ukraine. We could export the services, but we have a lot of obstacles here because institutional capacity of our vocational education institutions if, is far from uh, being uh, is far from the ability to teach international students. I mean, the language of curriculums, textbooks, uh, instructions, everything. Also, there is a great potential here. I think. And there are some obvious things that we have to deal with corruptions in the first system, uh, corruption during enrollment. But until our universities will take the process in their hands, I think until our universities take process in their hands, they will not be able to influence the flows of students. For example, there are several in, uh, universities who are in charge of enrollment and they provide uh, a process of a much higher quality compared to other universities. And also there is another end of spectrum. Uh, it's about the state. And I think Ukrainian society is um, not really ready to accept this policy of mass integration and uh, to accept uh, international student at the labor market. Well, this is my personal point of view, but we only seem to be a tolerant and inclusive nation. Actually, when it comes to some real cases, we uh, show not the best sides of our human nature and a lot of work needs to be done in this field 
and also we have this uh, this idea that we don't have enough working places we have unemployment and oh, oh my god international students will come and take our jobs i think it's it's quite a populistic thing but it it it, it exists and i don't think we should expect that some migration policy will emerge if we don't have the policies in broader context. I mean, the policies in economy, in uh, labor market, and until we have this regulated, we don't. We will, are not going to have any policy on attracting human resources from other countries. I just want to add one thing. I think we don't know yet what kind of changes there will be due to the boom of uh, 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 online education and uh, looking at different uh, polls and interviews in different countries. We see that people are ready to switch to distant learning, maybe not on the full scope after the COVID, but there will be a lot of uh, elements of online uh education online study we had a lot of examples when ukrainian students were enrolled in um uh, uh, international universities without leaving ukraine for example london school of economics is offering a degree of course you need to go to london several times but you are able to receive it's not actually a branch campus, but uh, there is a representative office here in Ukraine and uh, you can go and have your exams done uh, uh, in Kiev, for example, uh, and all with uh, all the necessary procedures. So I think there will be more and more of such approaches. And I think as of today, uh, Ukrainian universities are not very competitive they don't have response and they don't have alternative to their traditional ways uh, and they're not even able co to cover traditional locations like um, and uh, also all the post-soviet area um, africa asian countries are not ready as well so there are competitors like russia about seven years ago they deployed this branch campuses in Chinese universities. These are sub faculties uh, where the, the, the faculties that um, prepare students uh, like for two years, they do preparation studies for the students in China and then the students are ready to go to Russia to study full time there. Why I am saying all this? Because we have we hear from government like look we have so many international students or we increase the number of international students despite war in donbass no one is scared they still want to come to ukraine and we still hear this from the government and as miss larissa said and so what 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 is the purpose what is the aim behind this we are not even thinking about this bigger global goal. For the rise in the question of uh, the um, 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 of, uh, connected to um, the uh, uh, the problems with uh, crossing the borders and uh, that more and more university have some distant uh, connection with the students. So uh, I will invite all the speakers now just to try to think how uh, these developments connected to COVID would influence the flows of the students, the motivation of the students. More students will come, stay, uh, return. Uh, any uh, any thoughts that you have. Also, I would like, um, while you are thinking, to comment on the question in Q and A. Uh, and yeah, we in our panel uh, we have not only speakers and experts, but also these are the people, and many of them uh, do have some background. Um, 
uh, connected to student mobility and migration. We have participants of mobility programs. We have returnees, so the uh, those who were studying abroad and returned. So if you have some specific questions, uh, you can write uh, to our experts slash uh, people with uh, migration background. And uh, while uh, all the speakers are thinking about uh, the future developments of uh, mobility and migration in and out of Ukraine. I would like to give a word to Natalia uh, Shevchuk, uh, who has her hand uh, risen for some time. Please, Natalia. Uh, uh, I will talk also in Ukrainian, as I see that the question also in Ukrainian. Um, so I would like to comment on the question with regard to, to my personal experience uh, who took part in Erasmus exchange program in 2017-2018. Uh, so my experience and my motivation to take part in Erasmus program was that uh, I found out about that uh, at uh, about uh, 2014. So Erasmus program became available to Ukrainian students in 2014, but uh, the international office says we're not uh, working as they are now. This was more the opportunity for those who speak English, for those who study international relations, or for those who were studying something related to international relations. Well, at least uh, that's the experience from uh, my uh, Lviv uh, National University. So the students who took part in the FLEX program, a Future Leaders Exchange program for school students, quite often were disappointed when it came to the choice of the university to study in Ukraine. So they thought that it would make sense to join the Erasmus program and to apply to a university in other country. Why have I decided to, to apply to Erasmus program? That is because I had negative experience of communication with my professors at the university. I saw that our professors had their own stereotypes. And speaking of uh, the quality of learning and the quality of teaching, I should say that if there is no feedback from the students who are ready to show that they are interested in getting high quality knowledge, high quality skills, even those professors who are the members of academia, those who are interested in real researchers and not just uh, do it uh, for, for taking the box, uh, or any other economic component. They are also discouraged in teaching when they see this lack of feedback from students. And quite often, not all professors are proficient enough. And sometimes they even resort to, to some statements that are incorrect and inappropriate. So for me, in my case, I heard that you are not knowledgeable of Ukrainian literature. So I decided to, to apply to Erasmus program. I applied in three days. I wrote the motivation letters and I applied to a different educational establishment. I specialize in Eastern languages. This is a rather rare specialty in Ukraine and in Europe, but I was lucky because the university that was on offer from the University of Burgundy It had the opportunity to uh, select uh, your major and it uh, didn't matter whether you had the background in natural sciences or humanitarian sciences. Uh, so it, this was uh, the coincidence of uh, my personal preferences and the offer from the host university. So this was the stroke of luck in my case. Speaking of my own experience, uh, as now I work with uh, students and civic activists, uh, I can say that those who would like to stay on and uh, obtain high quality academic knowledge and who want uh, to pursue uh, this uh, path uh, of uh, academic uh, degrees, uh, they need to, uh, to be focused on their career and they are interested in staying on and doing researches in other countries. But speaking of the civic activists, I guess these are people who are interested more in getting back to Ukraine because they would 
be able uh, to implement uh, the knowledge and put to practice the knowledge that they would obtain in other countries. Besides, just another quick comment. We've been uh, talking a lot about motivation of the students uh, to study and to get high quality knowledge and skills and the opportunities uh, that our universities have in terms of providing uh, this high quality education. And you know, Ukrainians have uh, some expectations that uh, when uh, they go to foreign institutions, they would uh, become uh, very proficient. Uh, but I agree with Yegor Stadny that there is the lack of strategy and understanding in where we are headed. And that is the issue you know, not only for the Ministry of Education and Science. In general, this approach uh, with youth and the mobility which is not treated as a tool for intercultural dialogue and um, creating tolerance in our society. Tolerance to one another and also tolerance to our colleagues from abroad. Unfortunately, the mobility tool is not viewed as a priority, neither for the Ministry of Education and Science, uh, nor at the Ministry of Youth and Sports. And only starting from 2019, they started asking questions like, how can we offer youth more opportunities in seeing what is happening, not only in their community and in their city? How can we offer them a look into what's happening in other countries? And, you know, being the activist, uh, civic activist, I should say that uh, we need to have this internal exchange. Uh, and there is this uh, mobility program in the Eastern uh, Europe, uh, but uh, that was the attempt of uh, the Ministry of Youth, but it was not uh, well thought through, unfortunately, from financial point of view and also from strategic point of view. I am uh, the advocate of uh, Erasmus program and uh, I am ready to share what uh, this program could help with in the midterm perspective uh, till uh, 2025, uh, 2027. I can advise on uh, how efficiently we are using this mechanism and uh, whether we are ready or not to receive students from other countries. It's common knowledge that Erasmus is not just about academic knowledge. In Europe, quite often, this program is used more as in American context, in the context uh, as leap year. So this is uh, the leap year. This is the opportunity to look into the culture of other countries and to, to erase the borders. So quite often, it's not just about uh, this uh, attempt uh, to learn uh, more this is about uh, looking into the culture of other country we have uh, these opportunities uh, we have this opportunities uh, whether uh, these uh, conditions uh, that uh, are different from other countries because it's uh, cheaper to live in ukraine we have an opportunity to engage a high number of uh, students and uh, we can make a step uh, forward to creating more tolerant uh, society. But yet uh, there are questions uh, that pertain to the infrastructural readiness. And uh, the question of uh, work with people. Do we know the English language? Uh, are we ready to communicate? And are we ready to give information or not? Because, uh, you know, we either need to, to be well informed or we need to inform our students. So we need to, to have evidence-based uh, policies and not just uh, coming up with idea, trying to do something grand uh, without clear vision of uh, the direction we are moving to. Thank you very much. A good input to our discussion. And it's really a real life example. Thank you. Uh, Professor Denis Eckert, you have your mic on. Did you want to comment uh, on the development of uh, migration flows um, uh, in our Ukraine uh, in yes. the view of the COVID? And then Tatiana Shushkina. Yes, so I have mixed uh, experiences and contacts both in Germany and France. 
And I'm uh, myself, I'm uh, teaching uh, this semester in France. Um, and uh, so I have some uh, reflections on the future of distance learning and foreign migration. Uh, in my view, uh, for the future, when the peak of the pandemic will be away, uh, I guess um, that uh, dis distance learning can be assessed as a complementary resource for people, but not at the main channel for higher education. In my view, it's a pure uh, illusion and uh, without any possibility of socializing in a foreign country, I could not see uh, hardly any uh, serious incentive for people to uh, Moroccan students to enroll in a Ukrainian or German or whatever uh, university. So it's a question of quality of the uh, distance learning for sure, but if uh, the students uh, are going to lose the direct contact with the university, with the other students, I think uh, all this process of uh, international student migration will uh, be reduced to very, very small uh, flows and so non-significant flows. So I think for, uh, in my, uh, uh, once again, by uh, mobilizing my own uh, experience as an international researcher, as my knowledge of different uh, higher education system, I firmly believe that uh, um, dis distance learning is important and should definitely be developed, but as uh, this uh, complementary uh, resource for the future. Thank you. Tatiana Shishkina, please. Uh, okay, so uh, I think I will also in English, but I I wanna refer to Natalia's um, experience. So I have already I have also have been uh, to the mobility. So I was a Erasmus student, and uh, I was I think um, luckier than uh, my experience was I think more happier because I was really happy about education in my university. So, but the, the motiv <clears throat> my motivation was, uh, as I talked before, uh, it was about uh, that somewhere there is some, something better. So it is uh, the illusion that somewhere there is something better than here. So, however, um, I think uh, when you are going somewhere and you are understand that your um, uh, experience is, uh, relevant, it is competitive, it is a good also the um, for understanding for our so for our students uh, that we are um, like uh, high quality professionals and our education. So, okay, yes, I understand that my uh, experience is from Kima Hill Academy and no, not all universities have such uh good and high quality of education maybe but uh in another hand so this experience it is not a tool for migrate i mean like the mobility but it is tool to um i think to input and to grow i think somehow the uh, uh with, you also told about tolerance yeah so it's intercultural exchange and it is really good for uh raising this um between students uh, uh, like this uh, tolerance and uh, I also want to uh, answer the uh, question about future after the um, this distance learning um, I know shift for, uh, because of COVID in my view I'm not sure but it is not gonna be a really a huge part of uh, the education. I mean, like, I think it, it should be, but uh, the, um, so education, it is not only classes. Yes, so it is, uh, so uh, when you are interact with the professors uh, in, in person, it is another thing. So, and the people 
almost going to study somewhere to have to, to put themselves into the environment. And um, also it is important that, um, so this is kind of cultural aspect and this kind of um, being in this environment. And I think the best idea is uh, for shifting uh, this uh, distance learning is pre-education. So for students who want to go to study for Ukraine, it is like some uh, pre uh, preparational courses, like uh, language courses or uh, some specialization courses to be able to uh, to come to the Ukraine, to, to Ukraine, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> dear panelists, if someone else has um, some comments on the future developments of migration and mobility, this is your last chance <clears throat> to put this comment in our discussion. Okay, I don't see any um, I, hands. Yep. Alexandra, I'm, I'm very happy that CEDAS and uh, other organizations continue to dig this topic. And it's very important to stay, uh, stay active, at least studying the issue, because sooner or later, there will be a demand for uh, data or analysis driven policy in Ukraine, I think, and that will be uh, more than helpful then. Um, yeah, thank you, Hor, for the comment. Actually, that was the goal of the whole our forum to see, uh, to show this connection between knowledge and policy making. So that uh, that was the reason why it was a cross-sectional forum. And I would like to thank all the participants for bringing very different perspectives on the student mobility and migration today. Um, thank you for uh, the uh, issues that you have been arising today. Uh, and I will remind that we were talking about really various motivations of students to go um, to study abroad for full cycle programs to come to study in Ukraine, uh, to uh, participate in mobility programs, so the motivations are really, really different. And uh, we have risen the question of this cross-sectoral cooperation um, in uh, when we are talking about international students that are coming to any country, uh, whether uh, these uh, policies, labor market policies, and higher uh, education institution policies, and the policies uh, and the view of foreign students uh, of a country in general, are they in line? Uh, is there uh, this cross-sectional cooperation between policy makers uh, in the sphere? Um, thank you for uh, the discussion. Uh, and uh, uh, now, according to uh, our schedule, we have a closing event, and I would uh, like some of the organizations to help me to um, uh, coordinate the process and yeah, to inform what should we do next. Yes, now we have uh, people from the parallel event who will join us in, I think, a few minutes. So... Thank you all for the discussion and